What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today we are doing some overclocking. Yes, that's right. The age-old topic that's been discussed and exhausted through and through, but we're going to talk about it again today. And there's a couple reasons why. The first of which is because I'm just curious to see how good this freaking video card is at overclocking and how fast it is really. This is the Galax GTX 1070. This is their EXOC or Extreme Overclock, which is very hard to get in the US actually. I was only able to go to the Galax store. I had to go there and purchase it and have it shipped all the way from China or Taiwan or wherever it comes from. So it, it's not a very talked about card. However, it is gorgeous. It's completely stunning and it's supposed to be a pretty damn fast GPU in terms of GTX 1070 speed. So today we're going to be overclocking that as well as the Core i5 6600K that's in the build that we have here. Of course this looks a little bit familiar. This is December's PC of the month, the Epic RGB build. And yes, that was the best name I could come up with at the time. I am sorry. But the other reason why I want to talk about overclocking and how it impacts frame rates in terms of gaming performance is because there are probably a couple of you guys out there who are relatively new to PC building or new to overclocking in general that might still be on the fence of whether or not to go ahead and manually tweak the settings in your system or your BIOS in order to crank up the frequencies on your various components. So hopefully by the end of this video, you guys will feel a little bit less intimidated by overclocking while seeing what kind of performance gains it offers at no extra cost to you. Now, while I'm not touting this video as a guide or a tutorial by any means, it should help you guys understand just how easy it is to overclock your system while also understanding its impact on gaming performance. That said, before we dive in, just a quick little tiny disclaimer. Make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into, the risks involved with overclocking, and how overclocking a component in your system might affect your warranty with the manufacturer. Every manufacturer is different, and there's a number of components from different companies that can be overclocked, but they each have their own set of terms of agreement and operating standards, so make sure that you do your research before actually diving in and tweaking anything yourself. So make sure you avoid voiding things that you don't want voided. On that note, let's go ahead and take a quick look at the specs we're rocking here in the RGB build. Go ahead and watch that video, by the way, if you haven't yet. We're rocking an S340 Elite from NZXT. That is the chassis all of this hardware is laid inside of. We've also got an Asus Z170 Deluxe motherboard rocking a Core i6, wow. Core i5-6600K on the Skylake platform that's being cooled by a Kraken X52 240mm liquid AIO. Additionally, we've got 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance LED RAM at 3000 megahertz, a 1TB Crucial MX200 SSD with Windows 10 and all of our applications loaded up on there, and we've also got, I believe, a 500, no, an 850 watt power supply. Don't quote me on that, there's a power supply shroud so I can't see it, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's a power supply. Who cares? So let's go ahead and reboot the system. We're going to boot into the BIOS this time, and I'm going to give you guys a quick little glimpse at my overclock settings for our 6600K in there. All right, so we're in the BIOS now. We're going to go ahead and jump into advanced mode again. This is the BIOS on the Asus Z170 Deluxe motherboard, so we're dealing with an Asus UEFI. It's a very nice little BIOS. Uh, we're going to go into AI Tweaker, so we're going to go ahead and head over to the CPU core ratio, which is by default set to auto. We're going to go ahead and switch that to sync all cores, and that essentially applies the same multiplier to all four of our cores, which is exactly what we want. We want uh, our frequency to run on all four of these cores, not just one of them. So you can see here, I've already done some dabbling. I dialed in 47 for our multiplier, and if we go up here in the top left, it shows us what our target frequency is once we boot into the operating system. So right now, with a B clock frequency of 100 and a multiplier of 47, our target frequency is 4700 megahertz or 4.1, or I'm sorry, 4.7 gigahertz. Then we're gonna have to change the voltage as well. Now our CPU core voltage is by default set to auto. We're gonna switch that to manual. And you can see I've already dialed in 1.4 volts here, which is the minimum voltage that I found necessary in order to run this chip at 4.7 gigahertz stably. Um, anything less than that, and there was a little bit of uh, instability in certain applications, not all of them. And I'm sure depending on the CPU, uh, the 6600K that you have on hand, you might be able to get away with more, or you might not fare as well, depending on uh, the ASIC quality of that particular chip which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Now, something to bear in mind with manual mode is that whatever voltage you set in here will run 100% of the time. It doesn't matter if your CPU is under load or if it's idling, it will run at 1.43 volts 24 seven. And that introduces unnecessary heat into your system. And there's no real reason why you need to run at this voltage all the time. So what I would suggest to you guys at home is actually go with offset mode. And what that does, it allows your voltage to scale dynamically with whatever your CPU frequency is. So as soon as you go from load to idle, it'll actually scale down and roll back your frequency as well as your voltage in order to keep things a little bit cooler and more reasonable 
um, in terms of the voltage that's being sent to your CPU. While configuring your voltage with offset mode can be a little tricky at first, there's plenty of guides and tutorials on how exactly to do that, but for the purpose of this video, and just to keep things simple so we can jump right in, we're going to stick to manual mode at 1.43 volts. We're going to go ahead and save our settings, boot into the OS, and run a quick little stability test. So here's a look at our CPU running Prime 95. And just a quick disclaimer, if you are gonna be stress testing with P95, I would suggest using a version that's 26.6 or earlier, because anything after that is known to produce just extreme, extremely high and unrealistic temperatures uh, for, for reasons that go beyond my head right now that I, I can't really remember. But um, I would have loved to use ADA64, but my free trial ran out and I'm too cheap to buy a license. Anyway, CPU-Z right here, 4700 megahertz, right where our target core clock was supposed to be, that's looking good. And our core voltage is going up to 1.44 volts actually. Um, again, this is a high voltage for you to be running at 24 seven, but for the purpose of this video, that'll do just fine. So I think on that note, we've been running this for about five to 10 minutes now. It's looking pretty stable. I think we're safe to go ahead, shut this down, um, at least stop the test here and start overclocking our GTX 1070. All right, so I've got uh, Unigen Heaven 4.0 running in the background here, and we've got MSI Afterburner open as well as GPU-Z. And just a little background, a little context on the Galax GTX 1070 that we're dealing with here today. Uh, it actually has a boost clock out of the box. It is factory overclocked with a boost clock of 1783, uh, which is about 100 megahertz higher already than the reference stock speeds of the GTX 1070. But you can see here, um, due to GPU Boost 3.0, we're actually seeing a boost clock of 1923, which is significantly more than uh, what the out-of-the-box spec says, simply because we are well within our power and temperature uh, limits um, that we can set manually. So I'm going to crank these to 100 just so we can continue getting the most out of our boost clock there. And then we're going to we're not going to touch voltage for this video. That's for a topic for another video. Um, we are going to go ahead and tweak our CPU core clock here. So um, our GPU core clock, I should say. Um, I already set this to 130, I believe. And that seems stable. That's anything more than that. I was start, starting to artifact and uh, actually crashing out. And also 375, I believe, was the... No, no, 360. 360. I can just type this in. 360 uh, megahertz on the memory clock was the highest um, clock there that I was able to achieve. Fan speed on auto. We're going to go ahead and save that. You're going to see our boost clock jump up from 1923 to hopefully something more impressive than what you see here. Did I apply that correctly? Boom. All right, there it is. So now we're running at uh, just over 2 gigahertz on the GPU core clock and 2181.6 megahertz on the memory clock. Uh, the GPU temp is also going to go up a little bit just because we are running the card a little bit faster now, uh, but still 76 degrees Celsius. Oh, 77. Oh boy, it's getting warmer. Uh, that's still relatively safe operating temperatures. Again, this is just uh, to see how far we can take this and it looks like Unigen Heaven 4.0 is still running just fine. I don't see any artifacting from too high of a memory clock or anything like that. So I think at this point we have our CPU and our GPU clock, our overclocks, running stable. They are set, and I think we should just run some benchmarks comparing uh, results with the fully stocked version of this, of this system versus the overclocks that we've just put into place right here. And then we're going to go ahead and circle back, talk about the results, and close this video out with some closing words and conclusions. So on that note, let's fire up the benchmarks and see how our frame rates were affected by our overclocks. All right, so there you guys have the numbers, and clearly every single game that we tested saw some kind of benefit from simply overclocking our system. Obviously some games benefited more than others, but at the end of the day there was still a positive percentage increase in terms of our average frame rates. The overall average percentage increase across all six of those applications was 7.6%. So we saw a 7.6 overall, seven over between seven and 8% of an increase just from simply tweaking our clock speeds here. Now, while that's all fun and dandy, something to be aware of is that your mileage when overclocking may vary depending on a number of factors. The first of which is ASIC quality. So not all chips are created equal. Some chips, whether it be CPU or GPU, 
overclock better than others. And that's why you see companies like EVGA, for example, with their with the last generation of NVIDIA cards, were selling the Kingpin editions of their graphics cards. I believe that was the GTX 980 Ti that they were doing that with. But the Kingpin editions basically promised users a higher ASIC quality chip that would be good at overclocking. Definitely better than something that you would just randomly buy that wasn't advertised as being a great overclocker. That's not to say you can't get lucky and hit the silicon lottery, so to speak. It happens all the time, but it's never a guarantee unless the manufacturer or vendor specifically says it is a bin chip. And granted, again, you will be paying a premium if that is the case. Another contributing factor that helps determine overclocking potential is your cooling situation. So if you have an Intel or AMD stock cooler, you're not gonna be able to get away with the same clock speeds that we hit today. Heat is essentially the arch nemesis of computer hardware. And if you're increasing your clock speeds and your voltages, you're making your system run faster and work harder, which produces more heat. And if you don't have the adequate or proper cooling solutions put into place, then you could run into things like thermal throttling, which is when your hardware actually exceeds its safe operating temperature and thus has to automatically dial back or dial down the clock speed in order to get back into that safe thermal zone. Pushing your system to the limit without proper cooling can also cause your system to shut itself down as a failsafe in order to prevent any kind of physical damage from happening on your hardware. So always make sure you stay cool, stay in school, and don't be a fool. I'm gonna go jump in the pool. But with that said, guys, I think that's enough Kyle ramblings for one day. So I'm gonna leave you guys with this. Overclock your systems, do your research first, don't be scared, and enjoy the extra performance. It's totally worth every single penny that you won't be spending on it. But here's a question. How many of you guys are overclocking your own systems at home? And which components do you find yourselves overclocking the most? Your CPU, your GPU? Your memory? Your cat? I know someone's overclocking their cat. So please do share your specs and your overclocking settings. I can't wait to read all about them in the comments below. Till next time, guys, be sure to toss me a like on this video. I know it was a little bit more like introductory beginners, high level content, but if you wanna see more of it, let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to think of some more stuff along these lines. Till next time, guys, have a good one. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I will see y'all in the next video.